Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Christopher, how is the weather in Germany? Oh, today we are lucky, guys. We have a little bit of sunshine, lightly cloudy, so it's nice. Blue sky, so we could go outside. <laughs> I see that uh, we are now 62 participants uh, in the meeting. And uh, it could be nice to add uh, even now a group photo. So if you turn on your camera, we will be able to see you in the web conference. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. Okay. <laughs> and I would like the participants also, if they would like to join us. Hello, George. <laughs> so that we could have a group photo in the virtual amphitheater. Γιώργο, πίνεις καφέ, ζηλεύουμε και εμείς. Καλή σας μέρα. Καλημέρα. Okay, so we have some group photos. Mark, sit, sit down, I can't see. <laughs> okay, so we'll give a few more uh, minutes until we start in 10 o'clock.
Okay, so uh, I think uh, we could start since uh, I see that uh, there are 72 people connected already in our uh, uh, meeting. Yes, okay. Okay, let me share. In. So welcome everybody to this uh, meeting uh, that is uh, taking place in the frame of the Agritexil project. That is a project uh, financed by the in the frame of uh, the bilateral uh, Greek and uh, German uh, uh, countries, and uh, the title of uh, this project is uh, Development of a Textile with Silica Coating uh, for Environmental Friendly uh, Control of Insects in uh, Agricultural Production. It's a project that uh, started uh, during uh, 2018 and uh, I will show you later on the partners of this uh, project. We are happy that uh, we uh, have a good team that uh, started working early in uh, 2017 in order to build a proposal that was later approved uh, for finance. So a few words before uh, go, I go to the details of the project. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you first of all, all of you that are uh, joining us in this uh, web conference. And uh, I hope uh, that you will enjoy uh, this uh, web conference as we uh, enjoy it because uh, we are close to the end of uh, this project and uh, we are happy to present uh, some of the results that we have obtained up to now in this uh, cooperation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the partners that are uh, joining uh, today and uh, will present the results in this uh, conference and of course the organization team uh, since we tried to organize uh, this uh, conference and uh, try to disseminate in this difficult uh, time during due to COVID-19 restrictions, we planned at the beginning to have this conference uh, uh, in uh, a place and will be to be all together, not online like uh, we are now, uh, but uh, we hope that at least we will uh, present uh, and you can uh, see uh, some of the results that uh, we have obtained up to now. Um, let me introduce also uh, my team at the University of Thessaly. Uh, we are a lot of people working here in the frame of uh, several uh, projects. And I would like also to thank them for uh, being here uh, because without them I would not be able to uh, present all these uh, results, of course. And uh, also I would like to thank the partners of uh, this uh, project that are uh, Thrace uh, NG, Thrace Nano Guben and uh, Geosynthetics uh, SA uh, from uh, Greece. And of course, uh, ETA, the Institute of uh, Aachen uh, University um, from Germany, and Powder and Surface, uh, the company from Germany that we all work together uh, uh, for the development of, the, of this uh, project and of the results of this proposal that we uh, have obtained. So starting uh, a few words about the greenhouse, because the screens that uh, we are working, the insect screens are mainly applied for uh, the protection of uh, greenhouses uh, from insects. But uh, let me first say a few words why uh, greenhouses, why protected cultivation is so important and we uh, 
suggest suggest this system as a system for production and not uh, just the open field cultivations. Of course, greenhouses are uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to cultivate out of season all year round, and we know that uh, all uh, the consumers today uh, ask for products uh, independently of the season all year round. So in greenhouses, we have the opportunity to have a higher productivity per soil surface because we control better the inputs in the environment in this uh, case than in any other case. We have uh, a production, a system that is less affected by the uh, climate conditions. Uh, we can produce all year round. Of course, this is the case only for higher tech greenhouses because the greenhouses with uh, less equipment cannot produce all year round because they need uh, some special equipment to uh, control the climate during summer or during the winter. In the greenhouses we have improved pest control uh, since we can control uh, the insects that are entering in the greenhouse using the screens and of course we can control the fungi that is developed in the greenhouse because we can control the environment and if we create an environment that is not favorable for the uh, pests uh, and diseases, then we can uh, have a production clear of uh, clean of uh, chemicals uh, because we uh, uh, have a uh, preventive farm management. And of course, we have higher productivity. We have a better control because we can uh, control temperature, humidity, uh, we can uh, control irrigation and fertigation in the greenhouse, and of course pests and fungi. And here we can see some uh, very good examples of the productivity uh, per uh, cubic uh, water meter. For example, in the open field we can see that we have uh, some results that say that we can produce three kilograms of peppers per cubic meter of water that is used, while in the greenhouse, in a modern greenhouse, in a greenhouse that can control very well the environment, we can have 43 kilograms of peppers per cubic meter of water that is used. So we can see that we have a very high water use efficiency in uh, this case. And the same is also shown here as an example for uh, the tomato that needs one uh, that for one kilogram of tomato uh, to be produced in the open field, we need about 60 liters of water that this comes to four liters when we discuss for greenhouse uh, production. So screens, why we need to use the screens and why we suggest to use the screens? Because with this we can reduce the insects that uh, enter in the greenhouse and uh, then we reduce the need for pesticide use. And uh, screens can be seen in the openings, for example, of the greenhouses, in the vent openings of the greenhouses, and of course in structures that are completely covered by screens, by nets, that are called screen houses. But screens reduce the ventilation because we have seen that if we apply an insect-proof screen in the vent openings of a greenhouse, depending on the type of the screen, we have a reduction of the ventilation of the greenhouse. And this increases the temperature inside the greenhouse, increases the, the humidity, and then we uh, need a better control of the greenhouse climate conditions. Uh, screen houses, compared to open field, of course, reduce the high radiation loads and the wind speed, uh, reduce the rain um, intensity and uh, hail storms, and minimize, of course, the invasion of insects, allowing significant reduction in pesticides application. There are several different types of uh, screens that can be found in the market, and uh, a basic difference that I will uh, uh, note here is the whole opening area. That is how much of the area that the screen uh, takes is covered by 
threads or is free for the air to pass through the screen. So it depends on the opening, uh, which is of course depending on the type of the screen that we have and the uh, thickness of uh, the thread, the thread diameter that uh, is used for the netting of this uh, screen. I'm not going to go to details here, uh, but uh, depending on the uh, type of the screen that we are using, we reduce the ventilation inside the greenhouse. So the aim of this project uh, was to develop uh, an agricultural screen, an agricultural net that could not affect so much the ventilation of the greenhouse. That is to develop a screen that will have uh, a large ventilation area and will also uh, have a large effect on the insects that are going to enter inside the greenhouse. Will not have negative effects on the ventilation, but will ensure uh, that we will control the insects that are going to enter inside the greenhouse. And how we uh, obtain this? We developed a textile uh, screen that is coated with environmental friendly uh, nano uh, nano uh, particles of silica. We will see more details later on in the presentations that will be given by the partners. Uh, and uh, with this screen that we will have bigger mesh size, that is, uh, that we will have less effect on ventilation. We will uh, have an active protection of the uh, greenhouse or the screen house against the uh, most important insects through dehydration of the uh, pests of the insects that are going to enter inside the uh, construction, uh, inside the place that our crop is cultivated. So these nanoparticles are glued uh, somehow in the screen and when the insect goes to pass through the net, then is dehydrated and uh, uh, is not uh, uh, cannot stay alive for a long time as long as it enters inside the greenhouse or the greenhouse. So to work on this uh, project, we had uh, several work packages, uh, different uh, parts of uh, the work divided in different parts. And uh, this included the development of the uh, processes of covering the nets, of making the prototypes of uh, these uh, screens, uh, and then uh, in uh, later uh, stages to test these prototypes uh, in uh, real case uh, conditions in the greenhouses that uh, we have in the University of Thessaly. And of course, uh, one of the work packages was the dissemination that is uh, taking place today. This uh, meeting, for example, takes place in this part of the dissemination. Of course, this uh, work package is divided in several tasks. I'm not going to give you details about this. And uh, we had, uh, of course, a uh, time frame to work in each part of the work and several deliverables to deliver uh, about the work, which you can find, of course, uh, if you ask in our website where all the deliverables, the public deliverables uh, can be found there. Of course, in the frame of the project, we met uh, uh, the beginning at uh, early of uh, 2018 in uh, Germany at the beginning. And then uh, we met again in uh, Thrace, in uh, the facilities of uh, Thrace and G, and in uh, Greece, in Volos, in the facilities of the University of Thessaly. Uh, the last year we had, we planned to have another meeting, but due to COVID-19, we had again an online meeting, and we meet again today to present some of the results because uh, we are close to the end of the project. So for our dissemination, we have also developed a website where you can find the uh, news and deliverables of uh, our project. 
and uh, Facebook uh, page where you can see uh, uh, new announcements in relation to the uh, activities of the project. You can find also the newsletter of uh, our project that uh, presents the results that we have uh, during the project. More details about the results you will see uh, from the presentation that will follow. Of course, we have uh, already some good results from the project that have been uh, published uh, in collaboration with the Laboratory of uh, Entomology with Professor uh, Christos Anthanasiou and uh, his team. We have published uh, some of these results and we have more data to publish in the near future uh, because the experiments are still taking place in our facilities and we will continue during 2021 to uh, have some more uh, uh, experiments. Uh, some of the results have been presented in uh, a conference, but due to the restrictions again of COVID-19, we had not the opportunity to join more meetings and conferences and hope that during this year we will be able to present some of our results to the public. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, this was uh, an introduction of the project. And we will pass now to the rest of the presentation of this uh, conference. And uh, once again, I thank you and hope that you will join the, uh, this meeting. So the next presentations, the next presentation will be from uh, my uh, colleague uh, Sofia Payaga, that is working uh, in our team from the University of Thessalonica, and she will present uh, some uh, evaluation of different uh, silica nanoparticle formulations in the in their efficacy to uh, pest control uh, of uh, different pests that we tested. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sofia Fallaga, and I'm uh, very happy uh, to present to you today uh, the results um, uh, of the first experiments conducted in the framework of FibreDXC project. So, um, to begin with um, the evaluation of the three silica dust formulation, uh, in order actually to cover, to coat nets, insect proof nets with uh, silica dust formulations, we have uh, we had first to evaluate three different types of silica in order to find uh, uh, the most effective uh, against Aphis faber, which is uh, a common greenhouse pest, and against the Tribolium confusum and uh, Cetophilus orze, which are two stored product, uh, product insects. Uh, the silica dust formulations that we used in our experiments are namely Siloblock S200, Siloid ED3, and Siloid ED5. And uh, the main difference between uh, these uh, uh, two, uh, these three uh, dust formulations lies on uh, their particle size, with that of Siloblock S200 being uh, the smallest. After concluding uh, to the most effective uh, silica dust formulation, we coat the insect proof nets with this uh, uh, dust and then we evaluated 
uh, for uh, their uh, uh, aerodynamic characteristics in a wind tunnel in order to measure the pressure drop and uh, the air permeability of the nets. So, um, let's start with uh, the materials and methods of the first uh, experimental series in which uh, the target species were Aphis Fabe, Tribolum confusum, and Acetophilus oryzae. Uh, all these insects were exposed to three uh, types of dust, uh, as I mentioned before, at three different uh, doses. 0 mg, which is the control treatment of uh, the experiment, 12.5 mg and 25 mg. In total, we had uh, 27 treatments. For example, uh, Aphis Fabe was exposed uh, to S200 dust formulation, and then three different doses were used uh, in this experiment, and uh, so on. So, uh, 10 adults or, or larvae of each uh, species were exposed, were placed inside a, a petri dish uh, in which uh, the appropriate amount of uh, uh, dust formulation was used. And uh, then we checked, uh, uh, we evaluate the mortality and the knockdown effect of the insects after 5, 10, until 180 minutes. Uh, we have also tested the delayed effect of these silica dust formulations against uh, uh, the, uh, the insects. Uh, so in this case, again, we used 10 adults of each species that were placed inside uh, the petri dish with uh, the appropriate amount of do uh, dose of uh, silica dust. And uh, the insects in this case were exposed for 15, 30 or 60 minutes to the dust. Then we evaluate their mortality and knockdown effect. And after that, all, all insects were transferred to a clear petri dish, and then we evaluate again the mortality and uh, knockdown effect uh, after one, seven, and ten days in the case of um, the stored product insects, and after one day in the case of uh, aphids. So uh, let's move on to the results of the first experiment, and here you can see. Um, that uh, after uh, 180 minutes of continuous exposure of aphids to the S200 uh, dust formulation at the highest dose, you can see here that 50% of the insects uh, were under knockdown uh, conditions, meaning that 50% of the insects tested were unable to move. However, uh, as you can see in uh, the rest two graphs, uh, the knockdown effect of the insects was so much lower as compared uh, to the aphids, since uh, stored product insects are more uh, uh, tolerant uh, and hard-bodied. So here you can see that the most effective uh, dust formulation uh, for Cetophilus sorize was ED5 dust at the highest dose, while in the case of Tribolum confusum larva, uh, ED5 again proved to be the most effective, however, uh, the appropriate amount uh, of uh, silica uh, was 12.5 uh, uh, mg. Uh, concerning the delayed effect of uh, silica dust formulation against the insects, uh, in the first graph you can see again that uh, S200 uh, dust proved to be the most efficient uh, at the lowest dose for Aphis Fabe uh, insects. Uh, since one day of post-exposure to this dust for only 15 minutes, we can achieve 100% uh, percent mortality of the insects. However, in uh, the rest uh, two graphs, you can see that uh, stored product insects uh, uh, achieve the high rates of mortality uh, seven days, not one, but seven days after the exposure to ED5, uh, dust formulation for the lowest uh, uh, dose. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, the materials and methods uh, used uh, that we used uh, in order to uh, characterize the airflow characteristics of uh, the insects. Uh, so in this case, we used, we cover, we coat three different, uh, three, uh, in, three insect-proof nets of different mesh size, and then. Uh, we placed them in a wooden frame, as you can see here in the picture. And this frame uh, was placed inside uh, a wind tunnel. And uh, we test uh, the uh, airflow characteristic of the nets under nine different air velocities. 
So uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the pressure. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the pressure drop uh, um, uh, evaluation uh, as the air velocity was increased. And uh, it is really important to understand that uh, pressure drop depends uh, on the mesh size as well as the coating. Thus, you can see here that the nets that had uh, a greater mesh size, uh, for instance, here you can see the 50 mesh coated net. This net had greater uh, pressure drop as compared to the other nets. But in this graph, the most important result is this, where you can see that nets of the 25 mesh uh, size, which are nets that uh, have larger porous, uh, here you can see that the pressure drop of the coated and the non-coated nets is almost the same and actually is uh, lower as compared to all other nets. And finally, here you can see uh, the permeability results, where you can see that permeability was increased as the porosity of the nets increased. Uh, here uh, you can see that when we coat the nets with uh, silica nanoparticles, the um, permeability was uh, decreased. However, uh, after comparing the uh, permeability of the 25 mesh coated net, the net that has larger pores, to the most common nets used in greenhouses, which is uh, the 50 mesh and 40 mesh non-coated, you can see that uh, the air permeability of this net was, was much higher as compared to the other nets. So, uh, to sum up, uh, the most effective uh, dust formulation against Afis Fabe proved to be silo block S200, while in the case of the stored product insects, uh, the most effective uh, uh, dust formulation was siloid ED5. Concerning now the airflow characteristics, we proved that uh, uh, IP25 mesh coated net, the net of uh, the larger porous that is coated with silica nanoparticles, had the lowest pressure drop and the highest air permeability properties. So, to conclude, uh, silicon uh, dust formulations are effective in greenhouses and storage insects and can be further exploded through various uses, for example, in, in insect proof nets, in order to minimize the invasions of uh, pests inside uh, the greenhouse. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Okay, so we would like to thank very much uh, Sophia for her uh, excellent presentation, uh, keeping also the time. We have uh, three minutes for questions, uh, and uh, you are welcome to ask if something was not clear for you, or from the side of the partners, or from the participants of uh, this meeting. Okay, I see that there are no questions. Uh, I would just like to uh, note that uh, in this uh, case, we proved that uh, the screen that was uh, that had the higher permeability, that is, uh, had the less effect on the ventilation. Although, if we put such a screen in the greenhouse will uh, allow uh, many insects to enter inside the greenhouse. That is uh, some uh, thrips or uh, white fly or aphids may pass through this 25 mesh uh, net. Uh, and of course, we will have uh, very good ventilation. When we add the silica nanoparticles in this case, the uh, aphids that enter in the greenhouse uh, cannot uh, stay alive, die uh, one day uh, after they pass through the net. So we see that uh, if they stay, for example, for uh, about 15 minutes on the net, then 
these uh, insects uh, are dehydrated and uh, are dead one day uh, after the entrance inside the greenhouse. Okay, so uh, next presentation for this uh, conference is from the side of uh, our uh, university partner from uh, Germany, from uh, ETA, and uh, Mark Pellets uh, will uh, tell us more about uh, uh, this uh, work. Mark, uh, will you be able to share your presentation? Yes, I want to do this. Yes, you're right. Okay. So we have the floor to present your activities. So you can see and hear me quite well, I think, but I will continue. We cannot see yet your screen. Uh, we can hear you, but we cannot see the screen that you share. OK. Better now? No, still it doesn't come. But if we have the last uh, uh, presentation uh, that we have, if you send us this. Uh, yeah, I it sends you something, but I s makes some little changes, so I, I try this. Maybe I remove this one, it could help, sorry. You're not able to see this because I have this um, red frame around, so I think it should work. I don't know how, why it's not working. Try to share the screen, not the application. Try to share completely the screen. You're not seeing my screen right now? Yes, probably you have to accept uh, to accept something uh, in relation to the sharing of your screen. Uh, does it come to your uh, system? Uh, no, it doesn't. No, no. Otherwise, you could send us the latest draft and we can present it, we can share it from our side. Yeah, maybe we have to go this way. Okay. I'm sorry for this. OK. We have the latest draft from uh, Panagiotis that we'll present later on. Uh, Christopher, if you would like to send us also the latest draft so that if we have any problem, we share it from our side, please do it. I will send it also to you again because I made some minor changes. OK. Just in case. Mark, can you inform me as soon as you send it? Yeah, it's too big to send. That's why I'm struggling right now. OK, just share with, uh, uh, we transfer probably. Would you like to move on with another presentation, Christopher or mine, and uh, just change the yeah, order? Maybe we do this. Yes, probably. Uh, Christopher, are Give you ready? Mark something. Or Panagiotis? <clears throat> Whatever, I'm OK. OK, so we can... Uh, Excuse me, I'm in. I'm sorry. Uh, I just sent you a link to my presentation, but I 
only did some minor changes, so I think it's okay if you take my and front them if you want. So, Mark, uh, Christopher? Uh, yes, I sent you, you just sent you a link with my new presentation, but I only did some minor changes so I could take the old version. That's not really a problem. Okay, so, just a moment. I'm downloading and uh, we'll. Ah, okay, it. fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Would you like me to start over? I'm ready. Uh, oh, okay. So we can uh, go on with uh, Christopher's uh, presentation. Okay. Anytime that you need me to change the slide, uh, Christopher? Yeah, I will please give please. you a short uh, next, please, or something like this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so okay. please, Christopher. Uh, it's always the same story with tips, yes. Okay, so hello to everybody. It's nice to stay with you together today. Uh, yeah, so let me start with a short introduction of Powerland Surface. Please, next. Uh, the PNS is a specialist in mechanical engineering. Uh, we are located in Westphalia, in the middle of Germany, and we manufacture conveyor technology uh, for fine powders and uh, plasma-based uh, deposition systems. Um, in addition, we refine substrates for various customers and uh, on subcontract base. So yeah, we do a lot of jobs for big industry customers. Okay, next page, please. So CPPD, cold plasma powder deposition, what it is. It's a new coating technology based on the application of cold plasma technology combined with nanopowder technology. Please, next. So uh, next slide, please. Sorry. So how does it work? Um, the plasma is, uh, gen is generated in the actual nozzle. Uh, it's you see on the, on the button of, uh, of this presentation paper of, of this. Um, yes, right. And um, um, via a control system and a plasma generator, we need um, a high um, um, energy uh, support for this. Uh, um, with our power feeder, you see on the right side, uh, the silica powder is injected into the plasma flame and shown onto the substrate. So that is actually how it works in, in the baseline. So next place, please. Next page, please. Um, the powder feeder you can see here. This is one of the fee uh, of the key features of our technology. Um, the powder feeder generates a standing wave uh, in the powder via special control logic. Uh, this enables the dispersion and the agglomeration three, that's important, transport of fine powders, even nanoscale powders. Uh, at the same time, um, no air is required for transport, and that means the plasma not cools down so much. That's important, otherwise you shut down the plasma uh, flame. Please, the next page. Okay. So the plasma, it's uh, used, it's an atmospheric cold plasma jet. Um, this is actually, um, yeah, it's not equilibrium and not thermical plasma. So it's a, it's a cold plasma, it's uh, round about 1,800 degrees. Um, and uh, this plasma is normally used in the modifying of surfaces according to the state of the art. Surfaces oxidize then and the surface energy changes. That's the main point. But we also use this plasma to transport the coating and, uh, and to plasticize the substrate. 
uh, to melt in the particles then in the substrate. But I will show you this later in this presentation. Um, OK, maybe you can give to the next page, please. OK, so some technical facts which are very important for our uh, project work here is First of all, the particle size, you can go from around about 10 nanometers up to 150 microns. So you have a big variety you can choose of particles. So the next thing is the typical substrate temperature. And that's the main point. Uh, we can go from 30 degrees up to 100 degrees and melt on the thermoplastic, for example, a little bit, but without the uh, thermal um, thermal um, destroy, destroy of, of the substrate. So you saw this in, in last presentation from Trace or from ITER, so the, sh the shrank in the fabrics you can avoid with this technology. You don't heat up the substrate so much to, to plastify it and to uh, implant the particles inside. And another point is that we uh, reach a coating thickness, the last point, between 100 nanometers and 200 microns. It depends on what we want to reach. OK, so please, the next. So yeah, a, cold, a short consumption. We have fine powder and we have a cold plasma uh, jet. And together, uh, um, yeah, we inject micro and number scale powders into a plasma flame, shoot these onto substrates, and implant these into the polymer. That's the whole story. Um, OK. Next, please. Next page. So in consumption, here are the main advantages or the main points of the CC, uh, CTPD, sorry, uh, the low energy uh, and then environmental friendly and solvent free because you're, there's no need for uh, additional adhesives or, or solvents. Uh, it's a cold, active and easy to apply process. Um, the deposition rate is normally high. Yeah. Process speeds is up to 50 meters per minute. This is a point we discussed later in this presentation. Uh, the coating materials and there is no or no structural change caused by coating process. That is what I mentioned before, because of the low temperature we uh, established in the in the substrate. Uh, the direct application of nano on submicron powders is, is is possible. So we can change rather fast. Uh, the, uh, the, the powers we want to, to feed. Uh, the wide range of applicable plasma gases, uh, actually we only lose air, it makes it more easier to work with this system, uh, and a wide range of coating materials. You see this now in the next uh, pages, uh, we can cover metals and um, a lot of other substrates, for example here, uh, conductor tracks uh, on glass or polymers, also on 3D structures. Um, for example, uniform metallization under room conditions, like here to, to break a copper shield on a, on a waiver, or abrasive functionalization of brushes. This is our, how, uh, our main work I express later. So the next play, uh, page, please. So EMC shielding is a big point in, in computer, in the IT business. Um, we are able to um, establish thin copper layers on polymer materials. Uh, next page, please. And uh, this is a point, the tribological layers. Um, we can um, 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 modify substrates with abrasive, grainy, uh, particles so uh, that you can establish then a grinding functionality on, uh, for example, polymers like uh, foam or polymers like brushes. Uh, the next page, please. So you see some examples. There is a coating process of a brush, and on the right side in the button, you see a, microcos microcos uh, a microscopical uh, picture of a, such a brush. Um, you see it in a bigger um screen in the next page okay so uh, here we are what is the big difference with the plasma injection method and the classical of uh, um, mold um, um, technology we bring the particles on the surface 
uh, the matrix material remains unaffected on its mechanical properties, means that very soft brushes, which are able to follow the change contours of a complex designed object during an automated, automated processing can be constructed. So um, your, your brushes are uh, still remain smooth, so they are able to be very kind in the working process. And so you can follow the whole structure. It doesn't matter if it's a complicated geometry or not. Uh, so you have a total oppressive uh, work uh, or functionality with a very smooth uh, base substrate. That is very important. And this is a big uh, point for, for grinding companies. And we are there in our main business. So, but for our project, you only can get and imagine how it looks then uh, if we have some particles on the surface of, of a polymer substrate. Okay, uh, the next page, please. So now we come to the uh, to our project work. Um, we um, we have to do a lot of adjustment works to 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 find uh, to fit the 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 needs for the project, the aims of the projects. Uh, for example, the adaptation of the power feeding unit. We use a lot of another membranes and changes the specifications. Then uh, the diameter of the plasma nozzle, because uh, uh, silica particles are very um, uh, light and uh, they have uh, a lot of ability to change, to modify the plasma flame itself. So we had to change a little bit the parameters of the nozzle and the injection points. And last but not least, this was one of the major works, the adaptation of the plasma control unit. Uh, we have to modify the, the gas control and the valves and so on. And of course, the parameters of the uh, SPS of uh, the control unit. OK, the next page, please. Uh, so for uh, the um, movement of uh, the different uh, substrates we want to coat, we construct a coating drum. You always saw this in a video from, from Nikos. And uh, for, for fibers itself and special qualities of fabrics, we use a movement unit um, you see on the right side. Um, especially with uh, the smaller diameters with mesh 50, we need such a unit like on the right side. Otherwise, we get more problems with uh, the heating up of the fabrics and shrinking processes then. Because on the, light, on the left side, it's, it's, a, it's a drum with holes, of course, but uh, the outlet of the heat is not so optical. Uh, it's not so good like an, like an, um, if you bring it in an area in a free air, and then you move the plasma above it, like on the right side. Okay. So uh, the next page. So now we start with monofilaments. Um, this was to see uh, which shape could be the best shape for. Um, X, uh, for um, reach and maximum deposition. Uh, we have different ones, the X shape and quadrangular shape and a round one. And as you can see on the next page, please, uh, we reached the best deposition rates with uh, the X uh, shaped uh, monofilament. And uh, there's another point. We thought a lot of the way how we can swell, how we can plastify the thermoplast material of the monofilament. And then we find uh, the idea that we can use a swelling agent like paraffin. Paraffin is able to swell the, uh, the thermoplastic and then it evaporates immediately with the plasma nozzle, with the flame, and then everything comes hard again, becomes hard again, and uh, the, the particles are then better fixed. And as you can see here, we have the best results with deposition uh, always with the swelling agent. So it's uh, the second, uh, the fourth, and the sixth. But without swelling agents, uh, we have the best deposition with um, the small, uh, with three micrometer diameter with the small qualities of silica. This is based in the in the characters of the blowing of the plasma jet because uh, if you bring the particles on the surface of a fiber and they um, um, 
do not melt in immediately, they blow away. And the X shape reduces this effect because there you have like a gap, uh, sorry, like a trap that you can carry, uh, that you can um, catch the particles and hold them. So the blow effect from the plasma jet is around, but not in the trap itself. So the maximum deposition is in the X shape. Okay. Um, the next, um, I'm sorry, we are on. Um, uh, uh, the next big task was uh, to find out which particle size and which coating parameters deliver the best deposition results. Uh, we coated for this a mesh 50 fabric uh, with three different particle sizes and with and without uh, swelling agents. And of course, we take uh, different numbers of repetitions. And as you can see on the next page, please, it turned out that, um, first of all, <clears throat> the highest deposition rate, as I mentioned before, was with the smallest diameter of the silica particles. This is with this is uh, based on this blow effect of the jet, plasma jet. And the bigger sizes, diameters, ED3 and ED5, achieve only a significantly lower deposition without a swelling agent. Okay, um, but with this test by by side by the side, there was a very interesting idea. If only the glue effect of the swelling agent paraffin fixes the particles on the surface, if you go one side back, sorry, you can see the roundabouts about this points. There's a, there's a deposition without plasma jet only with a swelling agent itself. Uh, okay, go by it back, please. And then you can see uh, we reach with higher diameter, higher depositions, and this um, this glue effect is uh, is uh, is a strong effect. So um, this is a this um, bring up the idea to use an adhesive. I will show later in the presentation here. With the high flow uh, flow speed of the plasma jet, the deposition decreases with higher diameters. That is what I mentioned before. So the S200 quality with three, uh, three micron diameter was the best quality of silica. So uh, the going on with the project, we always concentrate on this S200 quality. Okay, uh, the next page, please. Um, so the conclusion of this screening was um, what I mentioned, the good deposition rate would also be possible with an adhesive without plasma jet, for example, a glue. But now the big point, um, the efficiency, the biocidal effect of the silica particles is the nanoporous structure. And we are a little bit afraid that um, capillar powers uh, from the glue, from, from, from a fluid, could be able to fulfill this nanoporous structure and then neutralize this biocidal effect. Um, we already did some coating work with, uh, with glue and um, bring this to the ETA for the mechanical things. And uh, in the future, we bring it to the UTH to check the bio biocidal effect. If this works, if this would work, that would be a very interesting alternative to the plasma jet coating. Okay, next page, please. Yeah, this is another big point. It uh, it turned out that uh, yeah, the capability capac sorry of the coating with the used plasma nozzle are not yeah not not uh, fast enough for the large scale process with trace. Uh, you can see here some parameters we already use for the coating of our samples. Uh, we have a, a stripe of 12 millimeters wide and uh, the speed is 80 millimeters per second. So it's not so much area we can code per second. That means we use a lot of nozzles to, to bring an inline coating uh, in truth, to, that it's work or not, and this is, yeah, at the moment this is not really an option because the invest cost for this would be too high, um, and we are, yeah, working to improve uh, the heating up process by plasma 
with alternative energy sources. The next, yes. Alternative energy sources, uh, in fact, there's only one really uh, alternative, or, or so, yeah, alternative is, is the ER emitter. Um, uh, the deposition um, without thermal, to, thermal damage to the fabric is, but is a big issue. Um, um, one second, please. Um, Preheating by ER um, before the CPPD uh, had practically no effect as the material cools down too quickly uh, to support the plasticization. Means the way from the ER source to the plasma nozzle is too long, so it's cool down, and so the effect is near zero. So the other way was that we directly um, feed the powder under the ER emitter on to the substrate. And uh, these samples uh, we reach, with these samples, we reach uh, a, a lead thin, uh, sorry, a thin deposition um, to, sh to, to, to check out which quality this disposition has in, in regarding realization for the bugs and um, staying on the fabrics for handling things. Uh, they are actually in the moment in the ETA to check this. Alternative, we check the most cheapest way of uh, additional heating, the hot air blower, but this was really no way to, um, to, to, to get uh, an improvement here because uh, the hot air is too imprecise and does not allow deposition. Uh, that was the end of the story in this way. So the idea before, use an adhesive, a glue uh, was was very important, and if we find out that um, the nanoporous structure will not killed by this glue, then we are convinced we could offer an interesting alternate alternative to the plasma jet uh, to melt in and uh, to fix uh, the particles on the surface, but they are not melted in them. They are only fixed with the glue on the substrate, on the fabric. And the question is now, it's then effective against bugs or not? Um, let me say a short sentence uh, regarding coat monofilaments and fabrics. Um, before we start the project, we was convinced, okay, we will modify the fabric and then it process to fabrics. Uh, sorry, we modify the monofilament or the filament, and then we process this to fabrics. But we still forget a little bit that we established there an abrasive functionality. So we make something like a grinding tool with this, uh, uh, with this uh, monofilament. And then if you work it on your machines, uh, you will kill the machine rather fast. So uh, we shot this package with monofilament coatings rather strong or bring it directly to fabrics. Coating with fabrics was the main work then. Okay, um, so the interesting is now the glue is workable or not. If it's workable, I can say it would be very interesting and very easy to establish then a coating process with with a glue fixation um, on the on the fabric. But we will see um, if the ETA give us uh, a green light that it's, it's hauled on the fabric in a good way, then it fixed on the fabric in a good way. Then we will do coatings with bigger examples, uh, and then we bring this to the UDH, and hopefully uh, we have the same results with bugs than with the melted in uh, uh, fixation of, of the silica qualities. Okay, uh, now I'm at the end of my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, please don't hesitate. Feel free to, to ask me if there are some questions. Thank you very much for your support, Nikos. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. And, uh, there is uh, some time. We are over time already, but uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, later, if there is a uh, one question, we could uh, have a reply. Otherwise, we can have it at the end of this uh, meeting uh, in the closing discussion.
So uh, we will pass, uh, as I do not see any question, we will pass to the uh, presentation from uh, uh, Mark from uh, ETA side. And we can give the floor to Mark to uh, present his presentation. OK, so after these technical problems, I hopefully I, I hope that it works now better. So let me in, in, introduce myself. My name is Mark Petzl. I'm working here at the Institute for Textile Technik in Aachen. Um, I will present today two presentations. The first is more a general one about um, agri-textiles uh, agri at ITA, so more general. And then the next one is um, more specific to the project Agitexil. So please click. Um, I divided this uh, first presentation into two parts. First, I give you a general overview about um, the university, my institute, and our research group, Melt Spinning. And after this, I will uh, talk a little bit about agritextural textiles at ITA with these three main topics, biodegradation and sustainability, drug release, and pest control. Um, on the point pest control, I will focus more because this is, mm, let's say, the, 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 the topic in which Agitech Seal fits in. Yeah, let me start with a general overview, Kisli. Um, the RWTH is my university. Um, I was um, starting there at 2011 um, with a, a mechanical um, engineering studies. I finished this and now I work here at ITA. The RWTH is a big university. It's uh, located in Aachen, as you see there, it's um, kind of the yeah, triple point of Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. We have um, 46,000 students and over 150 programs. Um, we have 260 institutes here and nearly 10,000 um, staff people who work there. Um, please click. Um, the ITA is also a big institute. I think it's the second biggest in for the um, uh, RWTH. It is the Institute for Textile Technik. Um, for the human side, we have 110 scientists working here. So people like me and we are supported by um, 60 technicians and service employees. And of course, we have a lot of um, students and undergraduates, uh, research assistants, so nearly 200. And we have a big machinery park with um, 12 lab devices and several um, mono and multifilament smelt spinning lines. Um, and the whole textile process chain we can build here or um, yeah, um, with a lot of also 240 machines in a textile process, uh, process chain. And just to, uh, yeah, I will just give you a clue about so this is not just the institute for textile technique the ita is rather a big group um, which um, consists of of course the ita the institute um, but also um, several different other um, um, small companies and small institutes and um, one of them is located in uh, turkey so we're a little bit um, spread over the world um, please click. Um, the um, next thing I want to talk about is the research group um, melt spinning, which I'm um, yeah part of it. Um, we focused here in on the research of polymer-based fibers, and of course we pro produce them in a melt spinning process. Um, we support partners um, in their problems and in um, yeah, their fields of interest. Our core competies, competes, <laughs> competes are um, the development of new material systems. Um, therefore, we blend or modify polymers, sometimes with adhesive, sometimes we mix um, the different, um, two different or three different polymers together. And we can do this here um, from a lab scale, so very small 
uh, to nearly industrial stay, uh, scale. Um, we develop concepts and machinery tools um, to uh, produce those filament yarns um, and we um, also um, produce um, high performance fibers um, with different uh, profiles or physical, optical or haptical uh, haptic um, um, functionalizations. We also um, are able to analyze those um, fibers we produce. We have um, two um, research rooms for this, um, one more for the polymer-based um, things and one more for the textile-based things. Um, we try to implement those projects with the focus on energy, efficient, energy efficiency and recycled solutions. And of course, in the um, times we're living now, we always try to proceed in the digital strategies. Um, so let me come, oh, sorry, so this was completely fine. Um, let me come to the second um, point, the agricultural textiles at, at ITA. And I will start with the uh, biodegradation and sustainability. So um, first we are um, in this group, we are um, focused on the circular production systems and circular ec economic systems, and we try to implement them to all these um, um, yeah, systems and um, uh, developments um, we're focused on um, with, with a focus on the reduction of residues, uh, for example, in agricultural textiles or in nets and gardens or um, big point is also the abrasion and dry and wet shedding on streets and gardens or in the woods and in, um, for fishing lines, for example. Um, the research and development steps are so we first focused on the evaluation of biodegradable polymers and we tried to find out if we have to or can adjust them, um, adjust the biodegradability. And then we are developing a melt spinning process and test our um, processed um, yarns. After this, we try to investigate the bio biodegradability but of course, we are um, not an institute which are focused on the um, biodegradability in these practical ways. So we always um, can um, realize this in a small scale and for a big scale, we have to um, yeah, work with partners like in this project as well. Um, um, then after this, we are manufacturing pro uh, product samples and we can ship them to the partners. Um, for the second um, point, we um, please click. Um, we focused on uh, drug release. Sorry. Yes, continue, Mark. Uh, is it something? Yeah, I'm not able to see this now because I don't know. It's okay. We can hear you and. Uh... You can see the uh, the slide with drug release. Oh yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, maybe I have a little bit of delay here. I don't know. Um, so for drug release, we can fertilize according to consumption very directly. This is a very um, yeah the advantage of this, and we um, can uh, incorporate. Uh, these repul uh, the repulsion and of insects um, with into the fiber structure. Uh, the, we can incorporate the repellents for repulsion of the insects into the um, fiber structure. This is a very um, um, it's, it's difficult, but it has some uh, advantages. And we can realize then specific and consistent re release of the repulsive drug over one or if it's necessary over more seasons and there we can um, we have to what steps there are we uh, evaluate feasible drugs and we uh, lay out the filament uh, design um, then of course we develop uh, the melt spinning process for these filaments test them and manufacturing product samples please next slide um, the third uh, topic is pest control, and I will go more into detail about this because this is, as I already mentioned, um, the topic for Agitextile. 
Um, so the growing world population that you can see there in the next yeah, 30 years, it will rise about two, mil, uh, two billion people, um, leads to an increasing demand for food. And simultaneously, droughts and insect pests due to the climate change or um, our production systems um, um, will um, make this problem more problematic. Um, and the currently high usage of insects and fields and greenhouses is a fact, but it's also a danger of uh, humans and the environment. And that's why we need um, another way or an, an alternative. And this project could be an, an alternative. Um, so we focused on the pest control with surface functionalization of sheets and nets. And this is um, a good alternative because it's uh, environmental friendly and not um, hazardous for humans. Um, basically, we um, evaluate feasible materials. After this, we design the filament layout and develop a melt spinning process. And we production those filaments then and uh, develop a coating process. But um, in this framework, we hear more in the uh, next uh, presentations and we already heard something from PNS. And the framework of uh, Agritech Seal product, uh, we um, use silica particles. Um, silica particles are porous particles with an absorbent surface. Um, and if the bugs or the insects uh, come in contact with uh, these par uh, pest par uh, these particles, the protective wax layer, as you can see in the uh, left picture, are absorbed from the particles. And um, so the insect, like um, the human with a wound, dries out because of water loss. Um, the silica particles, as I mentioned, are harmless for humans and they are approved for the agricultural um, usage. There's also a very advantage of these particles. Um, we use the cold plasma coating and it has proven to be suitable, a suitable method um, for agricultural textiles. Um, and we all already uh, see a significant reduction of insect pests when using the silicate coated, uh, uh, coated textiles. And this will present um, UTH later. Um, so thank you for your um, for your kindness to hear me and um, let's um, if you have any questions of course ask me uh, otherwise i think we can go into the break but first we have questions time okay thank you very much uh, mark uh, please uh, if you have any questions you can raise your hand and we can give you the floor to uh, ask something either re related to exactly the study of this project or in relation to the organization of its partner. Yes, yes please. Uh, uh, hello. Yes, uh, I would like to ask a question about the, the final panel, the agricultural net. Uh, I, I didn't catch the whole uh, presentation, but I was curious about the how economically viable would be to cover the agricultural net with white powder is is it an extra is it a, an added step in the uh, in the process of making the net is it more um, costly to make this or is it something that's negligible Um, so I should answer this question. Excuse Sorry, me, Mark, go on. Uh, yeah, okay. No, I'm done. Okay, then I, I will maybe answer this question. Um, so it's an additional step. So like um, um, p and or Christopher from p and just told us, it's the cold plasma coating we use to um, bring this white powder as I as um, write it down there, uh, bring onto the net. So we have to produce the net, and after this, 
we um, will um, apply the white powder with the silica particles um, with a cold plasma coating onto the net. Uh, okay, so I have another question about the substance. Does this um, has this uh, been applied in actual in an actual greenhouse uh, yet, or is this in the development stage? Uh, we will present some results uh, later on during the, this conference of application to real conditions, All right. not just lab conditions. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor, regarding, if I can add something here, regarding the cost, uh, because uh, we studied this issue, the cost of the coated uh, net, and it seems th that the price, of course, is going to be higher than the uncoated nets that are used now, and maybe it's a around twice the price. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, just to give you a rough idea. All right, okay. Thank you. Okay, then uh, we can have a break here for uh, 15 minutes. We are 15 minutes back in the program, but uh, let's have a break of 15 minutes and we will come back. Please stay joined and we will come back uh, for the last part of the uh, meeting. Uh, since we uh, have more than 80 participants now, it would be nice if you would like to turn on your camera uh, five minutes before uh, the starting of the next uh, session, that is 11.25 uh, for Greek time, 10.25 for uh, uh, German time, to have a group photo again and then we start the next session. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you would like to appear also in our uh, screen. And uh, before, during this break, I would like to note that uh, in two weeks time uh, from now, in the 8th of uh, February, we will have uh, another webinar that is related to the second uh, Greece-German uh, bilateral project that is running uh, in our uh, university from our team and is related to cascade hydroponics. Uh, it is uh, carried out in the frame of the same uh, call and uh, in this second project we have two other partners from Germany so uh, any of you that would like to participate also in this meeting, please uh, register. You will find in the registration uh, form again, and uh, you can register to participate also in the other meeting. So I don't see many people willing to turn on the camera and uh, take uh, group photos, so we will move uh, okay, it's nice. Please turn on your camera so that we have we have 80 people here connected. So please, it will be nice if we could see you all and have a group photo. It's uh, nice this application of together uh, preview of this uh, of MS Teams. Front seats are still empty, so please come in. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And we can give the floor now to uh, our next uh, speaker. Uh, All right. From uh, Thrace and G. 
Panagiotis, would you like me to share the presentation? Uh, no, I will try to share my screen first. Okay. To see, Please. To see how this goes. So we have three more presentations for the next session. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. So I'm I'm alright. Okay, I uh, I should start. Yes, uh, well, uh, I would like to say hello to all our guests. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, my name is Panagiotis Xidas. I'm a member of the R&D department of uh, Thrace and G. Uh, I'm going to present to you the activities performed from Thrace and G uh, under the framework of the AgriTexil project. Uh, my presentation consists of two parts. The first part is a short introduction uh, to Thrace and G and Thrace Group in general to show you who we are, what are we doing. And the second and main part is the contribution of Thrace and G to the project. Uh, okay, the project title is already known. Uh, I will skip that very quickly. Uh, the participants is the University of Thessaly, Thrace and G, PNTS, and uh, the ITA Institute. I'm going to speak on behalf of Thrace and G. Uh, a few words about our company. Thrace Non-Wovens and Geosynthetics, TNG, is a major branch of Thrace Group located in the area of Xanthi, Greece, since 2010. Uh, the company existed uh, since 1979, but uh, because the business was growing, it was decided in 2010 to split from the mother company and create uh, an individual uh, new company and with the name Thrace Non-Wovens and Geosynthetics. Our expertise is the production of polypropylene-based technical textiles, yarns and fibers, producing several products like woven flat and circular fabric, fabrics, non-woven fabrics like needle pants and span bond, multifilament yarns and tapes, ropes, twines, uh, roofing membranes, specialty textile uh, materials and many more with applications in several uh, domains like geosynthetics, agriculture, building and construction, industrial fabrics, packaging, and much, much more. Uh, as I said, TNG is a member of uh, Thrace Group. You can see here in the world map the locations where Thrace Group has uh, trading or production facilities around the world. And uh, very shortly, the group is converting more than 110,000 metric tons of polypropylene and polyethylene per year. We have operations in 10 different countries. Uh, we are using 28 different production technologies. 60% of our production is established in Greece, while only 19% of the sales is going in Greece. So we are uh, mainly an export company. Our sales network is established around 80 countries and we're selling in 24 uh, different market segments. For 2019, the group sales reached 328 uh, million euros, and the capex is uh, 32 million euros, uh, which shows that we are still expanding, we are still invest investing in new technologies, in research, and so on, and we're uh, occupying more than 2,000 employees. We are converting polypropylene into a world of materials and solutions for over 40 years in applications uh, like furniture and bending, geosynthetics, sports and laser, advanced fabrics and composites, industrial fabrics, automotive, construction, uh, straps and ropes, medical and hygiene products like uh, face masks and protective gowns for surgeons, uh, filtration, industrial yarns and fibers, packaging fabrics, floor covering, agricultural products, and many more. All these products can be divided, the group's operation can be divided into three main business units, uh, which are the technical fabrics for automotive construction, agriculture, and so on, the packaging with containers, big bags, uh, films, and wraps, and the agriculture. Going into the second part, uh, I will uh, show you the contribution to the project. Uh, to Thrace and G, we are assigned uh, six major tasks. I'm going to show you to present you the major tasks. 
The first was the production of mono and multifilament yarns. After coating with CO2 particles, the weaving of yarns into nets. Uh, number three was the provision of non-woven textiles for comparison with the woven nets. Number four was the investigation of alternative coating routes, except from uh, plasma treatment. The installation of inline plasma coating system and finally, the production of large scale nets for the field tests. Uh, I'm going to present those tasks one by one to see where we had some uh, problems and uh, where we didn't. Every, everything was just fine. Uh, under the first task, the production of mono and multifilament yarns, it was successfully achieved using high density polyethylene. On uh, the left side of of the slide, uh, you can see the uh, production machine uh, where the monofilament yarns were produced. You can see an image here, here how it looks like a monofilament yarn and the cross section of this yarn and how is the final commercial product. On the right side, you can see also the machine producing the multifilament yarns. Multifilament yarns are actually several monofilament uh, yarns of uh, smaller dimensions, smaller diameter, uh, twisted together into forming a bundle. And below you can see also the commercial product, how it looks like. Uh, after the successful production of uh, the yarns, they were sent uh, to P&S for coating with CO2 particles and characterization with the assistance of ITA. And then the coated yards returned to 3SNG for, for the weaving process. You can see here very roughly how, how the weaving process uh, looks like, uh, starting from uh, the yards, going into the machine, the loom for the weaving, and the final fabric uh, is uh, produced. Here we faced some uh, problems because the weaving process by itself is a severe process which harass the yarns due to the friction and high loom speeds. Uh, the coating of the yarns with CO2 particles resulted in uh, increased problems because of the abrasion phenomena and uh, two major undesirable phenomena. The first was the high CO2 particles loss because of abrasion and the lost particles resulted in significant amount of dust. Affecting, affecting both the people working there as well as the equipment. So it was decided that uh, weaving of uh, coated nets should be skipped, should be avoided, and uh, we should move on to weave the nets and then coat it afterwards. So uh, going into the second task, uh, the weaving of yards, uh, we used both mono and multifilament yards uh, in, uh, towards the formation of woven insect nets. Uh, the, mo the multifilament yards uh, resulted in uh, unstable structures and uh, opening sizes, and while in contrast, the monofilament yards yielded the woven nets with very stable structure and well-defined opening sizes. Uh, so we produced, using monofilament yards, three types of nets, the 25 mesh, the 40 mesh, and the 50 mesh nets. Uh, the main characteristics of the nets are summarized in uh, this table where you can see the mass per unit area, the diameter, the titer, the mess. And uh, we decided all together to investigate three different types of mess nets because different mess sizes result in different opening sizes. As, as already mentioned, by Professor Katsoulas, uh, the different opening size of the net results in different ventilation properties, which is the temperature inside the greenhouse, uh, different light, light transmittance properties, which affects the light inside the house and the growth of the plants. And uh, it affects also the insect intrusion, which is the number of the insects inside the greenhouse. Uh, in task number three, uh, together with the uh, woven nets that we sent to P&S, we sent also two non-woven uh, samples, non-woven fabrics, 
Abbott and Little Pants for coating and for comparison. On the left side, you can see how a spun bond fabric looks like and how is the fabric's uh, structure uh, uncoated and coated with CO2 particles. On the left side, you can see how a needle punch fabric looks like and its structure uncoated and coated. You can see how big is the difference between uncoated and coated fabrics. Uh, num task number four was the investigation of alternative coating routes like the hot metal lamination, because here we have uh, lamination machines, and we try to take advantage of uh, the hot melt lamination, but this was not suitable for this specific application because we are using a net, and a net has no substrate. Also, it has an open pore structure, so the glue was passing through the net and uh, causing problems to the production uh, pr process. Uh, so, since, since the use of uh, the lamination machine was not feasible, we tried to apply the glue by hand, very simply, with the aid of a brush. Uh, here in the image you can see the tank of the hot melt glue. The glue is here at, uh, 100, at the temperature of what, 160 degrees Celsius, which is above the melting point of the polyethylene. Uh, which was used for the production of for the net. So when the glue was poured on the net, instantly it was it was causing shrinking of uh, the net. I don't know how clear it is in these images, but these are the areas of uh, shrinking of the net. Uh, another problem using the brush was the very rapid cooling down of the glue. The glue was cooling down so quickly that uh, we couldn't spread the glue all over the net. You can see also here the direction lines formed on uh, on the glue by the effort of, of spreading the glue. Of course, the result is not good, and this uh, effort uh, was not very successful. So it seems that plasma treatment is a very well uh, designed technique for this kind of applications. So uh, we had to investigate the possibility of installing inline plasma coating uh, probes. Uh, in order to explore that uh, possibility, we requested for an offer from our core workers, the PNTS company. Uh, but the technical specifications of the system revealed two, two major drawbacks. The first was the very small coverage area per probe and the very low coating speed. Uh, Christopher already discussed about this uh, problem. And uh, I have to say here that the area and the, and the speed of the coating system is very low compared to the industrial machines that we are using. Because I have to say that our machines are, are pretty large, are pretty, pretty big. Uh, so a techno-economical study was realized on this issue and concluded that in order to cover just one of our looms, uh, it would be necessary an amount of uh, 20 probes with a cost around 1.1 million euros. Uh, just to have a, a, to make a comparison, a new machine, a loom for weaving, it costs around 200,000. So uh, investing 1.1 million just for the probes is pretty expensive and the product would be also very expensive. Uh, so it was decided that uh, this idea is not very good for the moment. And we replaced the production of uh, large scale nets with semi industrial scale nets and we sent them to PNS for coating. So uh, the last task was uh, the production of large scale nets. As I said, we decided to uh, replace this with, se with semi-industrial scale nets. We sent them over to PNTS for coating, and then these nets were returned back to Thrace and G for shoeing in order to prepare larger skin screens for the field test. And uh, after shoeing, the, these uh, larger nets were sent to the University of Thessaly for measurements and field tests. Uh, 
closing the presentation, uh, I have to summarize some positive and negative conclusions. The negative conclusions were that multifilament yards are not suitable for net production because they exhibit loose structure and unstable opening sizes. The coated yards are not suitable for weaving because of the significant CO2 loss and uh, dust generation. The hot melt lamination is not suitable for glue application on nets, specifically on nets, because there is no substrate below the net and because they have an open uh, pore structure. Uh, the effort for manual spread of hot melt glue is not also not feasible because of the high viscosity of the glue, the rapid cooling down, the local net meltdown and the time consumption of the whole process. And industrial inline plasma coating is still an exp expensive technique uh, because of the high purchase and operational cost. I'm expecting, expecting that in the next uh, few years, uh, the cost and the technology will uh, move ahead and the cost will, uh, will, will be significantly reduced. The positive conclusions from our work is that monofilament yards are suitable for net production. Coating of nets can be performed after, weaving the pro after the weaving process without any drawbacks, any side effects. Plasma coating is a suitable technique for coating of nets compared to other more traditional approaches like the cold melt lamination and the glue layup. And uh, the CO2 coated insect nets exhibit significant instant repellent performance uh, as uh, professor showed already in an environmentally friendly way, which was the scope of this project. Closing the presentation, I would like to thank the project, to thank all our participants for the nice cooperations that we have. Of course, for the funding, the European Union and the General Secretariat for Research and Technology in Greece uh, through the operational program EPANEC. And all of you for your attention. I'm uh, at your disposal for any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Panagiotis, uh, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, if there are some questions, we can have uh, one, two minutes for uh, discussion of this. Otherwise, we can uh, move to the next presentation and have a more general discussion at the end of uh, this meeting. Okay, thank you, Panayotis. It seems that there thank is you. no question. Uh, so we can move to the next presentation uh, from uh, our partner in Germany, from ITA, from Mark, again, to present the characterization of silica coated textiles in the agricultural sector. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, sir, I will. Yes, try to keep the time so that we uh, finish uh, on time. No, okay, yeah, I have this in mind. Um, so please click. I will go on with a second. Um, um, so I just want to make sure that we're all clear about this. That's why I make a little bit of background about the silica particles and um, how they um, are used in this project. Um, so as you can see there, last time it was a little bit uh, small, that's why I make it a little bit bigger here. Um, as you can see, the silica particles absorb the wax layer and um, due to the absorption of the uh, wax layer, the Sheetonius shell um, are now, um, yeah, let's say open and the uh, water can or will um, remove from the insect. It is deadly for bugs, it's good for us but it's harmless for humans, it's also good for us, and it's approved for agricultural ap applications. Um, so my second uh, presentation I um, outline in three major topics. First, the investigation of the influence of the uh, different fiber structures we use. Then second, the characterization of textile nets we did here at ITA. Um, and third, the comparison between textile nets and non-wovens. So I will start with the investigation of the fiber structure. Um, 
we um, produce three different fiber structures. We use three different fiber, stru fiber structures. First, circular shaped, so the kind of normal standard one, and two um, more specific ones, um, the cross shaped and the angular shaped. You can see um, the microscopy picture at, at the right side of the slide. Um, the investigation are based on the mechanical properties in a tensile test and we coated these fibers um, with silica particles. So um, we and in the product and the, um, in the Agrifix seal project, of course, it was um, P and S from our side. Um, and we also uh, did microscopy pictures from them. As you can see, the cross shaped, as uh, Christopher already mentioned, are um, the um, best ones, and the um, though they are coated. The, the coating was the, the best one there. Um, but in general, I can uh, note the coating does not have a negative effect on the mechanical properties and the coating of all three fibers where possible. Um, so let's uh, go on to the second um, um, point, the characterization of textiles. And I will start with the light transmittance. So we, um, we find out that there's um, three um, factors, main factors are identified. First, the light transmittance, the air permeability, and the tensile strength. And the variables of variation we um, take a look on are the number of coating repetitions, the size of the particle par uh, silicate particles, and the use uh, or not the use of a primer. And as I already mentioned, I start with the light transmittance. Um, the light transmittance, as you can see in the picture on the uh, left side, um, you can note that this is only the average um, from the um, probes we uh, take. And you can see that the uh, use of a primer increases slightly um, the light transmittance, and the other variables reduces the light transmittance. Um, um, the second point, uh, thing I want to talk about is the air perm permeability. Um, this, uh, you can see that the um, coating of the textiles are decreasing the air permeability by 6%, um, but this is still um, beneath 10%, and this is kind of the aim of the project, and this, so the aim of the project is still fulfilled. Um, a third, uh, I want to talk about the tensile strength um, of the coated textiles um, and the um, variation there are between um, or more or less than 10%. So it also fulfills the, um, the proposal or the aim in the proposal. Um, and then I want to talk about the last thing, so this is a comparison between textile nets and non-wovens. And first, I want to uh, give you a picture about um, of the non-wovens, um, needle punched and spun bonded. So these are the two types we um, uh, do the investigation on, um, with and without coating. Um, and we have two variables. First, the distance um, of the coating process and the speed of the coating process. And the, um, all the uh, sample numbers we will um, see in the next slides are mentioned here so that you have a clue about what I'm talking about. So all these um, samples um, titled with, uh, with zero are always the reference and the other one are the coded ones. And MESH2 is kind of the reference, so this is um, not a non-woven, it is um, um, a net with, a, um, this is a net. So to, com to have the comparison between non-wovens and nets. So what we did here was basically two things. We first um, investigate the non-wovens and um, um, compare them to the not coated non-woven, and then we co co um, compare this one to the nets. Um, for uh, the light transmittance, as you can see on this slide, um, the best light transmittance or the highest light transmittance um, we reach with uh, sample one for needle punched and sample three for spun bonded. 
And the lowest there was uh, sample three for needle punched and sample two for spun bonded. All in all, I can say that as well for needle punched and for spun bonded, the coated samples um, have a lower transmittancy than the uncoated samples and um, the uh, light transmittance is significant, significantly lower compared to the reference fabric. Um, then about the air permeability, um, the best or the highest um, um, air permeability for needle punched are sample three. Um, I will not um, tell you all the numbers. I think it's um, a little bit uh, too much numbers. So that's why I, I uh, just make it like this, but you can see the numbers there. Um, and for spun bonded, uh, it's a sample one. Um, the lowest uh, air permeability for a needle punched is sample one. And as you can see also in the graph, um, the lowest for uh, spun bonded is sample two. And for needle punched, the coated samples are, uh, have a lower air permeability than the uncounted sample and significantly lower compared to the reference fabric. Um, and for spun bonded, it's kind of the same. Um, the last thing I want to talk about are the um, comparison of the textile nets and non-wovens regarding the tensile strength. Um, the highest tensile strength is uh, achieved with sample one for needle punched and sample two for spun bonded, and the lowest uh, sample, uh, for sample two for needle punched and sample one for spun bonded. And it is mentioned, or it has, it has to be mentioned, that the coating does not seem to have a significant effect on the tensile strength, not for needle punched and not for spun bonded. But still, it is significantly lower compared to the reference fabric. So let me conclude. Um, all three fiber cross sections could coat it and investigate it. Um, the light transmitted increases slightly with the use of a primer and the other variables reduces the light transmittance. The air permeability decreases by 6%, but still fulfills the aim of the project. And the tensile strength changes by coating by less than 10%. And regarding the non-wovens, all non-wovens have lower characteristic values compared to the reference fabric. So let's say in the framework of these um, nets uh, and woven fabrics are preferable to non-woven fabrics. So thank you for your um, attention, and if you have any questions, um, I will kindly ask. Uh, I will kindly answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this clear presentation and for keeping the time. Uh, also, so we are on time for our next uh, presentation. We have one two minutes uh, to for some questions, if there are any. So I see that we have no questions and uh, then we can move to our uh, last presentation that is related to the final evaluation of the coated uh, nets in the field, in the lab and in the field trials. And again, my colleague uh, Sofia Fallaga partner in this uh, project from the University of Thessaloniki will present uh, some of the results that we have up now. Uh, hello again. Uh, in uh, this presentation, oops, yes, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, show you uh, the results of the evaluation of the coated nets uh, conducted in uh, lab and field trials. So, 
to begin with uh, the uh, laboratory trials, uh, we first evaluated an insect-proof net that was coated with two different uh, dust formulations, uh, namely ED3, siloid ED3 and siloid ED5, uh, in different mass density concentrations uh, against uh, Afis Fabbe, Tribolum Confusum and uh, Cytophilus Orize. Uh, in two of uh, the four treatments, we also added uh, a paraffin as an organic primer on the net surface in order to increase the mass deposited silica. Uh, it's pretty important here to uh, note that uh, all nets had uh, the same mesh size, which in this case is 50 mesh. Uh, Let's move on to the field trials in which we evaluated uh, another insect-proof net that was coated with another silica dust formulation, namely S200. And in this case, we just tested uh, the uh, efficacy, the insecticidal efficacy of the net against uh, Afis Faube. And in, the, in this case, uh, we used a 25 mesh size net uh, which is uh, a net of larger porous as compared to uh, the net that we used in, our, in uh, the laboratory trials. So, uh, in uh, the laboratory trials, the target species was again uh, Aphis fabetri volum confusum acetophilus orize, and we tested four insect proof samples of the same net, which are uh, ED3 net, uh, a net actually that was coated with ED3 uh, dust formulation, ED, ED3 with paraffin, ED5, and ED5 with paraffin. And, uh, the materials and methods uh, in this presentation are uh, uh, similar to the one that I presented you before, so in order to save some time, I'm going to uh, skip these two slides and uh, move to the results of the first experiments in the lab. In the lab. Uh, so here, in this graph, you can see uh, that um, in the case of Afis Fabe, uh, the most effective uh, uh, net uh, it was the net that was coated with the ED3 uh, dust formulation. And here in this graph, you can see that uh, 180 minutes of continuous exposure to this net led to 100% um, mortality uh, of uh, Afis Fabe species. Uh, however, uh, in uh, the, labo the, the laboratory trials, we realized that there was no mortality or knockdown effect detected in the case of the stored product insects. Uh, moving on to the delayed effect of uh, these nets on uh, uh, the insecticidal efficacy of uh, the tested insects, uh, we present you here the results uh, obtained from the Afis Faber trials. And here you can see that all nets proved to be uh, effective uh, on the mortality of uh, aphids since uh, uh, one day of post-exposure uh, for 60 minutes to the treated net, uh, we had achieved 100% uh, mortality rate. Uh, however, uh, in the case of uh, um, the stored product insects, uh, this situation is changing, is modified, uh, as you can see here, concerning uh, the Cytophilus orize insects, all nets again uh, proved to be uh, working well. However, uh, the, the effect was, uh, uh, we, sh we saw, we saw uh, an effect seven days after um, the exposure of uh, the insects uh, for 15 minutes to all nets. Uh, however, in the case of uh, Tribolum confusum larva, uh, it is obvious that none of the tested nets proved to be efficient, and uh, the, only result, uh, the only results that we can present you here is that the results uh, from the ED3 net coated with paraffin, uh, in which uh, the mortality rate did not, did not exceed uh, 30%, uh, even 10 days after the exposure. Uh, now I'm going to present you uh, the methodology followed in the field trials in which the target species was only Afis Fabe. And in this case, we tested an insect-proof net uh, of 25 mesh size uh, against this insect. So, uh, in this experimental setup, we used five mini greenhouses. Two of them were uh, covered with uh, non-coated nets. 
uh, while uh, the rest uh, three were covered uh, with uh, CO2 treated nets. Uh, we conducted uh, in uh, the field trials, we conducted three, um, uh, three experiments. In the first experiment, we used uh, tomato plants, uh, while in uh, the other two, we used bean plants uh, as they were considered more, more susceptible to aphid uh, infestation. Uh, the infestation in this, uh, uh, in this experiment was artificial by introducing infested plants uh, outside of its uh, bioassay unit. And uh, after that, we were expecting for the insects to walk uh, on uh, the net and enter uh, the greenhouse in order to infest the healthy plants. So, uh, three times per week, we collected leaf and stem samples and uh, we tested, uh, we measured the amount of uh, insects uh, on the leaves and uh, the stems in, uh, of the plants in the laboratory. So here I present you the results of the first trial conducted on tomato plants. And uh, here with uh, the blue, blue color, you can see uh, the number of aphids found on the leaves of uh, the plants that were grown under the control treatment. While with the orange one, you can see the number of aphids on the leaves of the coated nets. Here, it is obvious that uh, uh, we had uh, infestation in both uh, treatments. However, uh, in the control treatment, here you can see that uh, more uh, aphids were found on the leaf area of the plant. Uh, here, as I said before, uh, bean is uh, considered a, a more susceptible plant uh, to aphids. So here in the first graph, you can see uh, that uh, the infestation on the leaves was, was much higher as compared uh, to the coated net. Uh, we, we, you can say that uh, in the case that we have 70 aphids per leaf on the control treatment, only seven uh, aphids were found on the coated uh, on the on the leaves grown on the coated net. And here in this graph, you can see uh, the results obtained from uh, uh, the stems evaluation, uh, where uh, the infestation uh, was uh, much higher as compared to the leaves. But uh, still here you can see the big differences uh, as we compare the number of aphids on the coated and non-coated nets. And finally, uh, here you can see the results of the third trial uh, where you can see again the differences between uh, the two uh, nets. Uh, we have also tested, uh, uh, we have also used uh, coated nets uh, in greenhouse, in a big scale, in a large scale uh, greenhouse, uh, in order to see uh, the insecticide efficacy of the net. Uh, the data are not presented uh, in this presentation. And uh, in the future, we are planning uh, to uh, have another experiment conducted with uh, nets, coated nets of uh, 40 mesh size. So uh, let's move on to the conclusions. Concerning uh, the laboratory trials, we saw that all nets seem to be effective against Aphis Fabe uh, after one day. Um, and uh, concerning uh, the Cytophilosaurus, again, all nets were, uh, uh, were effective. Uh, however, in this case, seven days uh, were needed in order to achieve 100% uh, mortality. Um, unfortunately, Tribolum confusum insects uh, uh, were more tolerant to uh, these nets, and uh, the, only, uh, the only remarkable effect was found to be 10 days after the exposure to the net, to ED3 net, and uh, the mortality was only 34%. And finally, in the field trials, uh, the population of aphids under the CO2 uh, treated nets was significantly lower as compared to the control treatment. Uh, so in this case, we proved that coated nets uh, with, uh, uh, of 25 mesh, meaning that is a, a net that, uh, um, that has uh, great uh, ventilation properties, can be used in greenhouses uh, with, uh, the same, and this, at the same time, providing uh, insecticidal, great insecticidal efficacy. So thank you for your attention. And in case you have any questions, you can ask.
Okay, thank you very much, Sofia, for uh, this presentation. And uh, I see that uh, we have at least uh, one question. And uh, still any, you can please have the floor. You can. Hello, ask. thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, for the last presentation, and uh, if it is possible, I have an other two questions generally. Um, I want yes. to ask, um, I didn't understand quite well, um, when the insects pass uh, through the silicate coated textiles, uh, do they um, pass through the greenhouse and uh, some days after they die, or do we want them to die immediately? when they touch this uh, textile? Yes. So if you allow me, Sophia, to reply, uh, the point is that uh, we uh, tested two things together. First of all, if we have uh, an exposure of the insect for some minutes, because the insect, uh, it goes to the screen and then enters in the greenhouse. So if we have an exposure of the insect for some minutes, we see that then it enters in the greenhouse, but it cannot stay alive. It uh, it dies uh, sometime later. So uh, this is the effect of uh, the lab that we uh, found, and I think that the results uh, are shown uh, here. If I'm not wrong, that. One day after, the uh, aphis, uh, that is a greenhouse insect, aphis harbor, uh, dies. So it enters in the greenhouse, but it cannot stay alive. So this is a very important uh, result, which shows that even if the insect goes in, then it, can, it cannot uh, stay alive for uh, long and uh, it dies, so we can uh, have a very much lower population of the insects, as we saw uh, really in the results in the field, uh, in the greenhouse dryads. So yes, the insect does not die immediately, but it dies some time later. And uh, because it needs one day to uh, die, uh, in that, during that day, isn't it harmful to the plants? Uh, uh, it, it carries some, um, uh, you know, um, parasites and yeah. stuff. Uh, it may have some effect, but since it cannot uh, uh, increase the population of insects inside, it cannot produce eggs and then uh, have new insects, then the population stays very low and the effect is uh, not significant for the crop. Okay, thank you very much. If we have any other question, we will be happy to reply. Uh, what I wanted to uh, stress here is that uh, finally we succeed to have a screen that uh, it uh, can affect the insects that enter in the greenhouse. And this is clearly shown uh, in this presentation. Uh, with the results that we have uh, here, where we can see that the population of the insects inside the greenhouse is very uh, much lower compared to uh, a control greenhouse. So even if these tests were in small scale greenhouses, uh, we can see that these are very promising results. And of course, this is a first step to prove this concept uh, of uh, the project. And if we pass now to the general conclusion, let's say part of the presentation of this conference, we can say that as a project, we succeed to obtain what we promised to prove this concept, to produce a net that is promising for the uh, reduction of insect population inside the greenhouse. Of course, we will continue the uh, measurement during the next season in a larger scale greenhouse where there it's not so easy to have accurate measurements because 
there are many other factors that may uh, be different between the different greenhouses. We will test these screens in uh, uh, three uh, different greenhouses of around 200 square meters each, and we will include the insects, the insect-proof screens in the vent openings of these greenhouses. But you understand that in field conditions, it's not so easy to uh, have so accurate measurements. I, we consider that the proof of concept uh, has been given and that now the ball is on the industry part to see how they can produce uh, larger quantities of these uh, screens to have a larger uh, uh, scale production so that we can uh, then test it uh, more and more in the greenhouse sector. So, Christopher, yes, please. And I would like all the partners uh, of this uh, project probably to uh, turn on the camera and uh, appear in our uh, audience here and uh, uh, also add to the conclusion of the proposal. Yes, uh, Christopher, please. Yeah, uh, one question was, um, OK, regarding the problem that we, we hopefully have some scale uh, scaling effects for the price for, for the deposition, uh, the plasma technology, etc. Um, there was a discussion in Germany about uh, um, your assessment. For example, now at the moment we have um, the situation that we code 100 percent of the net. Uh, the idea is now that if we generate something like a trap, like a pheromone trap or something like this, or with, with a colored area, that is uh, that it could be successful that we only uh, code a part of, of the total net. And then with the pheromonic thing or with, 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 with the visual thing, um, the bugs go directly to this area. Then there's the release of material and then they die also. Um, so that we can save a lot of um, functional area, you know, it's more cheaper than to integrate a functional net, maybe a square meter or something like this in a, in a total amount of 100, no, that's too much, uh, of 10 square meters of net. What do you think about this idea? What is your assessment about this? Thank yes, you. we know that uh, insects uh, are attracted by the different colors and, um, for example, uh, thrips are attracted by blue blue color or white fly by yellow color and uh, the same for aphids. So if we could produce a net, a screen that will have this color, then a strip, for example, of this color in the vent opening, then uh, we could uh, attract more insects at this strip that will be also covered by the silica nanoparticles and then uh, have the effect directly to them without being uh, necessary to cover the total area of the screen. This is a very good idea okay. and uh, we could uh, probably test it in the future. I also like this idea, Christopher. It seems very promising, and uh, I'm pretty sure that this can be done. The production of colored uh, net. Yeah. So maybe, maybe this way, uh, there's one advantage of the plasma technology that you can, yeah, go to a target. Especially, for example, you have the whole dimension there, a roll with the fabric, and then you could organize. You have a movement unit, and then you you always go on one area. It's the same with the adhesive, with the glue. You know, the uh, the thing with the glue, it it, it depends from the um, bios biocidal effectiveness. Uh, when we cover the peros, then we kill everything but uh, of the functionality. But if it works that uh, the fluid evaporates maybe 90 percent, on the one hand, we have some problems with VOC in your production line. OK, that's the point we have to discuss. On the other side, then we have a rather easy way to for, for the deposition, you know, and um, yep. uh, because uh, the power feeding unit, it's always the same. Then we make something like a dusty area where the particles are in this room and you have a very homogeneous uh, dust area and then under under the net there at the bottom line there's a suction unit and to have uh, you know like a like a circle this would be i think 
rather easy to establish than in a in an online in a, your favorite process. But um, first of all, okay, two major points: uh, if we don't kill the functionality with the glue, this one important thing, and another thing, uh, if we can concentrate on only small parts, functional parts, yeah, then we can bring down the cost um, x. Yes, of course. Um, very strong. Yeah. Okay. So of course you are right. You are right, Christopher. And it seems more clever to try to to guide the insects in a specific area, which is more far e more easy to prepare than uh, coat the whole greenhouse with uh, uh, an insect net. Okay. So looking forward to. Uh, I would suggest that we. Uh, prepare some more quantity of nets with the glue edition, and then we transfer directly to you, Nikos. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, that uh, maybe we can make a short test. It works or not? Because you can't see it with the microscope. Microscope. Uh, sorry, <laughs> under the microscopy. Uh, microscope. Micros yeah, under the microscope. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it's better to to test it in 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 the reality with the bugs and the uh, yeah. ability to kill or not. Okay. Yeah. So we will prepare this in the next weeks. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. Okay. And uh, one thing that I would also like to note uh, to our audience also is that uh, in the frame of the project and with this idea, uh, Trace and G applied for a patent. And uh, this patent is at uh, European level, if I'm not wrong, uh, because yep. the idea is uh, really uh, new and uh, it deserves uh, the patent that we uh, applied. Yeah, actually, it's a Greek patent uh, for the moment, and now we applied for a European patent about this uh, is, uh, nets, insect nets. OK, so I think uh, we can close this uh, conference, this meeting here. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody uh, found uh, this meeting interesting okay. and the information that was presented uh, interesting. And uh, we will uh, continue working on uh, this uh, project until the end of this year for the Greek side and uh, try to produce more news uh, soon. Uh, See, Stigiani, would you like to ask something more? Is it uh, something that we can? Uh, yes. Uh, do we have time to ask it or? Yes, of course, we can ask now. Thank you. Um, I want to ask. Uh, I'm referring to all who made presentations today. I, I want to ask uh, for how long is the silicate for textiles effective? I mean, if some if somebody puts it in their greenhouse. For how long will they have them? And um, if uh, and then if we if they are not effective anymore, can we recycle it and reuse it again, or does it end up in a rubbish dump? I can reply to this uh, question? question. Yes. Uh, so we are not sure yet for how long it can keep these properties. Because, in fact, we have not tested it for so long. The uh, longest time that I have we have tested is about uh, six months, I think, now. Uh, but we need more time because the project, uh, uh, the screens were available only during the, this period to, for uh, field tests. So we will continue the tests and see for how long we can uh, have the screens these properties. As soon as uh, they lose their properties, uh, the screens can still stay in the vent opening uh, and continue to work as a barrier for the insects. Uh, and uh, of course, at the end, uh, they can be recirculated as all the greenhouse covering uh, and netting materials. Uh, professor, if you allow me to add something. Yes, uh, I, I suppose that uh, in theory, uh, as long as the CO2 particles remain uh, stuck on the net, the the effect is still on. The, the effect of CO2 particles, the abrasion uh, phenomena there, uh, is not fading out. As long as the CO2 particles remain on the net, then it's still active. 
the the process of removing of CO2 particles because of the weather of uh, uh, the sun uh, whatever it might take years but but we don't know that for sure this is the yeah. theory okay so we are on testing on uh, testing now yeah. on this trial yes Christopher mm, regarding um, the the transfer of particles as I understand right then there's a need that we have to transfer silica particles to the bug, to the bugs. Otherwise, there is not this suction functionality. So the, the contact uh, means that the particles are on the skin of the bugs, right? So um, this was the point for the deposition, um, that, that we have to find a solution that we have a uh, releasable deposition of silica particles, that if your leg go on the net or your body, then you have the transfer of the silica particles. Otherwise, if only there's a contact with a coated fabric, um, there's only too short time for this section, the wax section from the, so the chitin uh, skin. Um, so that means, um, yeah, obviously, if you have a lot of uh, migration of bugs through the nets, then you have some areas where everything is collected by the bugs. And then this area is poor of functional uh, releasable silica particles, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe we can we could think about a recoating, maybe in a built-in situation, or maybe yeah, that would be the nice one. But without plasma, obviously, then then with a glue version, we have to mm -hmm. find, uh, we have to check. And like otherwise, uh, yeah, yeah, and otherwise. Um, if we go this way with uh, the trap, with the pheromonic, uh, or with the um, that we um, make an area especially attractive for bugs, then it could be possible that the, this area um, 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 protect against rain impact and 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 wind. So, for example, if you make like a small um, structure like a house and there's a pheromonic thing, then and then you have a you have a, a tape, tape full of dust, full of silica dust. There's a big reservoir situation then, and you don't bring it out with rain and wind and such things. Only uh, um, for for the future tests in the field tests, maybe we can generate something like this trap. Then you have a long, long time of of uh, functionality because there's no mechanical impact by the weather, you know. Maybe an idea. Okay, Sean, thank you. Okay, Thanks. so if there is uh, no other question, I would like to thank you very much, to thank uh, all the presenters and to thank uh, all the participants uh, for this uh, uh, meeting, for joining us, and uh, we'll be happy to see you again in the future in another meeting. And of course, to thank again the uh, collaborators of this uh, project and uh, uh, participants of this project and uh, for this excellent collaboration and hope to have the opportunity to collaborate again in the future in another project. Thank you to Professor and all the participants here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much also from the ASEAN. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye.